I'll be honest with you guys right now, if I can be very transparent, uh, I like having fun when I preach because I try to imagine if I'm in your seat, like, I don't be bored, right? <laughs> but I feel the Holy Spirit has been ministering to me ever since I got onto this campus. And I, what he's been putting on my heart is that there is a, a family, a marriage, that there is this cycle of dysfunction. And I wanna encourage you, whoever you are, this is for you. This is for that person as well that is struggling with sin. And I just need to be obedient to God. And I say, listen, I wanna have fun and I wanna be true to the word, but would you please focus? Because God has a word for you. Amen, church? So God, I'm gonna get on my knees right now. God, I don't take your word lightly. And I thank you so much for the opportunity to come here and share the word with my brothers and sisters. And I ask you, God, that your Holy Spirit will move mightily tonight, that you would open our ears, that you would open our eyes, Lord, and that you would soften our hearts as well, God. And I ask, Lord, if there would be anybody in this room tonight that does not know you as their Lord and Savior, I ask that today, Lord, would be the day that they come to know you as Savior and as friend. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, Nehemiah chapter nine, the context. Here we go. The wall is built. It's working. It's keeping out the enemies of Israel. And Ezra read the word. He read the scriptures in chapter eight. And you remember the response of the people. Ezra read this from morning to midday. And the people stood and they, they said, yes, amen, amen. We want more. And the thing I love about chapter eight, it says the people heard it and they understood it. Oh man, the word had saturated their hearts. I gotta say that again, church. The, the word saturated their hearts. These are the people that had Torah. They had the scriptures. They weren't uh, a stranger to it. They knew it intellectually. They knew it on Bible trivia night. Ding, Moses, right? Like they knew the answers. But now as they hear the law, they're like, Oh, it makes sense. We're in trouble. They made the longest journey ever known to humankind. The longest journey is 18 inches from the head to the heart. It is a journey that is perilous. It is a journey that is scary. It is a journey that so many people are too afraid to take because man, what if I do it wrong? Right? Like, I know God is loving. I know God is forgiving. I know God is merciful. I know, I know all this stuff, but you still don't apply it because you're afraid of the journey of 18 inches. In Psalm chapter 26, verse two, it says this, test me and try me, O Lord. Test my mind and my heart. Tonight, we're gonna talk about the very famous and very popular topic tonight of repentance. I don't know why they gave me the hard ones. <laughs> Fear of God, not tonight. Repentance, great. For you Greek scholars out there, the word repentance is metanoia. Metanoia could also be uh, defined as rethink your thinking. I used to be a driving instructor back in the day. It helped my prayer life immensely. It was great. And I remember at the same time, I was a youth pastor and I told my kids, because they're learning how to drive at the time, I'm like, whenever you think about repentance, think about U-turns, right? You're going 100 miles per hour, some of you, right? Uh, you're going 100 miles per hour and you see that U-turn, what do you do? Do you turn just a little bit? No, you turn all the way. You go the opposite direction. That's what repentance is. It's not just a one-time thing saying, Jesus, you're my savior, and you never repent again. No, man, sometimes we need to repent every day. <laughs> I am going one way in my pride. I'm going one way in my lust. I'm going one way in my ego. I'm going one way in building my kingdom. And Jesus says, you turn, repent. Today is a day that you can have those chains broken, is what Pastor Anna said. Today could be the day that you no longer have that dysfunction in your home. You can get rid of that pride and you can say, I am sorry, I repent, but I'm getting ahead of myself. Point number one, repentant hearts, repentant hearts. 
See, as we read in Nehemiah chapter nine, we read the first five verses and I've got to paint this picture for you again because it's so easy to go, man, do you know how long you read? That was like 15 minutes, man. I know, you know how long it took to record? <laughs> but, but what had happened, here's the picture. They heard the word, they understood it and they took it to heart saying, oh my gosh, we need to repent. We need to make a U-turn. We need to ask the Lord for forgiveness. And so what did they say right here in, in verse one? They began to fast. They had sackcloth. And what else? They put earth on their heads. Can I break it down for you? I will, okay. First, fasting. They abstained from eating because they saw how spiritually bankrupt that they were. And in a sense, by saying, I'm not gonna eat, I'm not gonna nourish myself, they're saying we are so troubled by our sin, food seems unimportant. Let me say it a different way. We are so troubled by our sin, tacos seem unimportant right now. That's how serious we are. They wore sackcloth. Sackcloth, in case you don't know what that is, it's like a potato sack and how itchy it is. Like no one really wants to wear that unless you're super cool. But what they wanted to show God was their spiritual poverty. In a sense, they said this, we are so troubled by our sin, the normal comforts of life are unimportant. It's so unimportant right now. The entertainment that I have, my, my coping mechanisms that I have are so unimportant right now because I have a heart issue. I have a sin issue that I need you to deal with, God. And then it says they put earth on their heads. What does that mean? It means dirt. They got dirty and they humbled themselves and they were in such a lonely state in front of God. But also as you continue reading Nehemiah chapter one, oh, sorry, chapter nine, you see that they did this not only in front of their fellow Israelites, they did this in front of their neighbors as well. Those that didn't know better, those that didn't know Yahweh, they said, hey, we have to do business right now and we're gonna humble ourselves. And look, imagine this, right? You have the whole entire nations around you and here you have a people who are grabbing the dirt and screaming out, God, forgive us. God, we are so sorry. God, we didn't know better. Like God, and then they're just piling it on. What did their neighbors think? Don't go to their house for dinner. <laughs> whoa, whoa. And so let me ask you a question, church. When was the last time you asked God for forgiveness? Can I, can I change it up a little bit, church? When was the last time that you were extremely remorseful, like genuinely remorseful? Like you had this godly sorrow that you're like, oh my gosh, I can't believe I'm doing this. And it goes down the pit of your stomach. Have you ever had that before? When was the last time? Because once again, church, as I came onto this campus, once again, I'm just thinking about this and I'm thinking about those that are stuck in their sinful patterns. And at one time, maybe you were on the internet, maybe you're doing something, saying something, I won't get specific here, but at one time when you were doing those things, wasn't your heart beating pretty fast? And as you do it today, is it still moving as fast? Because we have hardened our hearts and we have called sin friend. We've kind of, we found comfort, we found security, we found hope, we found coping, all this. And what doesn't glorify God. So the last time these people are saying, God, we are so sorry. And in fact, Jesus spoke about this, about the topic of repentance. He says, when was the last time? You remember in Matthew chapter five, it's known as the Sermon on the Mount. This was Jesus' time to speak to the people and say his manifesto in a way. And, and, he, and his audience were only, not only the people that were the spiritual elite, like the Pharisees and the Sadducees and all the Essenes and all that. But the thing is like, there are people, the common folk, you and me in that audience. And Jesus says the Beatitudes. Have you ever heard the Beatitudes before? The Beatitudes is a different way to say blessed. Blessed are you. In the Greek, the word blessed also means envied. Envied are you. Or even this, prosperous are you. 
Now, if you were in that audience and if you were a Sadducee or a Pharisee, like the religious elite, like the super nerds, right? <laughs> They'd be like, oh yeah, blessed am I if I read all this Torah back and forth and know it verbatim. Blessed am I if I could debate and beat anybody. Yeah, I know I'm to be envied, right? Or blessed am I who prays out loud in public to get all the people's attention. Like, look how poetic I am in my, my praying. Go ahead, Jesus, tell it. Come on, Jesus, tell me how blessed I am. But as we know, in hindsight, Jesus talked about an upside down kingdom. And he said this in, in verse three, he said this. He starts with a doozy. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of God. Now, if you were the spiritual elite, you'd be thinking, hold on, you lost me. Blessed are the poor in spirit? That doesn't make any sense. Well, th there's a different translation. The Berkeley version says this. Blessed are they who know their spiritual poverty. I, I like making my own translations too. It, it, it goes like this. Blessed are the honest people who realize they are not God and need him for forgiveness, identity, purpose, and power. Here's a different translation. I'll make it more concise. I'll make it super simple. Are you ready for this? Blessed, to be envied, prosperous are you if you're a spiritual zero. Any spiritual zeros here? Okay, I'm the only one. <laughs> All right, at least it wasn't zero. All right. Thank you. All right. <laughs> You are spiritually bankrupt. You are a spiritual zero without Jesus. Like there is no way that you can earn heaven. There's no way that you can earn God's favor. There's no way that you can psych God out by like, hey God, I gave to the poor so much. Like look how much money I get. And God's like, I need you in heaven. Come on, man. Like no, without Jesus, you are poor. Like you, there's no hope. But blessed are you because yours is the kingdom of God. My fellow spiritual zeros out here who can't do it without Jesus. The kingdom of God is available to each and every single one of us only because of Jesus. Isn't that good? But then Jesus drops another bomb. Oh, he, this is awesome. Okay, look, he says this. Blessed are those that mourn, for they shall be comforted. Now, you guys have heard this quote before. You guys probably hear a lot during funerals, right? Like, what do you say to someone who's lost their husband or their wife or their child or whoever, right? You try to say, oh, the Bible says, blessed are you mourn for you can be comforted, right? Yeah, that's good. God is near to those who are brokenhearted. But the context of this verse is a little bit different right here. He says, blessed are those who mourn because they need to repent. Blessed are those that come to an understanding of I am spiritual zero and I have no hope without Jesus. And the Greek, it paints the word mourning for wailing, loud crying, a severe loss. We experience this mainly with death, but in the Greek, it's written in the present active. What does that mean? It means it's not an action that happened a long time ago. It's every single day. It is present. It is active saying, God, I can't believe I struggled with this again. Or God, like, I, I keep going down. I keep trying to make a U-turn, but for some reason I keep coming back. Like, God, I, I'm tired of this battle. Blessed are you who mourn. I, I love this quote. It says this, the closer you live towards God, the more you will mourn. Because even Paul the Apostle, the guy who wrote so much of the Bible, right? The guy who was a missionary that traveled all over, this amazing guy. What did he say? The closer he got to God. Oh, wretched man that I am. Who will save me from this body of sin and death? The closer you live towards God, the more you will mourn. The light will always expose our deepest areas of our hearts. Are you with me, church? The closer you get to God, it doesn't mean, okay, I'm, saying, I'm good, I'm gonna be comfortable now. No, there's always work to be done. 
the transformational process that God brings you through and pulls you through to become more into the image of Jesus, it's gonna take all our lives. And we get to participate with that. I love what C.S. Spurgeon said. He said this, let a man once feel sin for half an hour, really feel its tortures. And I warrant you, he would prefer to dwell in a pit of snakes than to live with his sins. If you can look on sin without sorrow, then you have never looked on Christ. Happy, blessed, envied, prosperous are those who are unhappy. To know how fallen you are, because as you grieve, look at this, blessed are those that mourn. Why, what, what's gonna happen? For you shall be comforted by God himself. Blessed are the ones that have that reality, that genuine interaction with Jesus saying, God, I messed up. God himself will comfort you. You will not be left alone to deal with it. Get, get right first, get clean first, right? Like read the Bible first, then come to me. No, God says, I will comfort you myself. Oh, church, that's good. They shall be comforted. The, the comfort immediately comes after the morning. In Psalm 34, please write this down, note takers. Psalm 34, verse 18, the living Bible says this, the Lord is close to those whose hearts are breaking. He rescues those who are humbly sorry for their sins. Oh man, I like the message paraphrase a little bit better here. It says this, if your heart is broken, you'll find God right there. If you're kicked in the gut, he'll help you catch your breath. So back to our story. Here are the Israelites. They are grieving. They are mourning. They're putting dirt on their head like, oh my gosh, in front of their neighbors. And then they start going into a history lesson, which brings us to point number two, is they're relearning the same lesson. They're relearning the same lesson. They remember that God had made a covenant with Abraham. You have performed your words, they said. And this is this, like, Lord, you had promised this land to Abraham and his descendants, and now we are here. Your promise is indeed true. They, they were thinking about this. Finally, as I get out of the picture, finally, as I get my nationalism out of the way, finally, as I get whatever issues in my mind out of the way, I think about God and his track record. God, you said to Abraham, our forefather, and you kept your word. They remembered that God delivered their ancestors from Egypt. Lord, look at what you did with our ancestors. Like when Moses was up on Sinai, seeing you with the thunders and the lightning, it was amazing. And we feared you. Our ancestors made a golden calf and they worshiped. They, this is God from now on. Like God, I would have given up on our ancestors, but you didn't. They remembered that God had delivered them and they took time to see God's faithfulness. They also remembered their ancestors' shortcomings once again. And it wasn't just a one-time thing that they had shortcomings. Like, man, these Israelites, oh my gosh, they were so bad. How bad were they? They were so bad. <laughs> they complained about the food. We're gonna have manna again? Come on, Moses, like we want some meat. Can't blame him for that. But like, we want some meat. And so they're saying it so many times, Moses prays for it, they, they get quail. They eat it so much, they start to barf. It's in the Bible. It's a true story, right? And they're like, oh my gosh, why'd you send us out here to die, to you know, barfing to death? And then, right, you keep on going on. You see that these Israelites, once again, are crying, oh, did God save us from Egypt to, to die of thirst? And so guess what Moses did? He, he Will Smith the rock, right? And then water came out and... And, and it was amazing. These people are drinking water, yet they continue to complain. And in Numbers chapter 11, you, you see Moses, and Moses goes to God and he prays. And he says this, look, read it. It's in Numbers chapter 11. He says, God, why, why am I to take care of these people? Why am I the leader? Did I give birth to these people? Why are they my responsibility? And then Moses said this, Moses of the Bible, this is too much for me, God. Just kill me. Just kill. like he was driven mad to that point of saying, God Himself, the author and finisher of our faith, right? The creator of all heavens and earth, kill me. 
these people are crazy. <laughs> and so in Nehemiah, these people are like, yeah, our ancestors are crazy. And yet you were so faithful. You didn't give up on them. And they remembered God's gracious reply over and over. And it says this, you remember, but you are God ready to pardon, gracious and merciful, slow to anger, abundant in kindness, and did not forsake them. I think some of you guys need to hear that again and remember the character and the heart of God. This isn't some cosmic teddy bear in the sky going, oh, I can't wait for you to mess up, right? Or, oh, I'm gonna play games with you. I'm gonna slap you in the back of the head. I heard that so many times, it drives me crazy, right? But, this is the character of God. Once again, you are God, ready to pardon, gracious and merciful, slow to anger, abundant in kindness, and did not forsake them. Man, God is good. And lastly, the Israelites remembered God's faithfulness. My favorite part, I don't know if you noticed in their reading right there, you see my favorite part? Man, even throughout all the victories and all, again, all the land and so on right here. I, I love this part of the verse. It says this, they ate and were filled and became fat. Yes, Lord, and delighted themselves in your great goodness. Man, God blessed them so much that they had to make an extra hole in the belt, right? But I gotta tell you guys my favorite exercise Bible verse. You guys ready for this? In case you guys need some inspiration to lose some weight. Leviticus chapter three, verse 16. If you want to open there, go for it. It's an amazing chapter. But Leviticus chapter three, verse 16 says, and the fat belongs to the Lord. Yes, Lord, have it all. <laughs> yes, Jesus. <laughs> they remembered his faithfulness. They remembered his goodness. And even though Israel would continue to be in the cycle of obedience and then disobedience, obedience and then disobedience. It goes on and on and on and on. And yet God never gave up on them. And yet God still continued to give them prophets. God continued to bless them as a people. He never left them. And when they cried out, God would always come back and return and take care of them and bless them. Here's a quote for you guys. I need you to hold to heart right now. God's faithfulness in the past demands your trust for today. I need to say that again. God's faithfulness in the past demands your trust for today. Question, what were you worried about five years ago? What were you losing sleep about five years ago? Are you still losing sleep? Isn't God faithful? They remembered God's faithfulness. And they said, yes, Lord, we thank you so much. And this brings us to point number three is this, remembering his grace. The thing is, guys, it would make sense, right? But with these Israelites that they, they had the sackcloth, they're fasting, they had the, the, the dirt on top of their heads, like, God, we're horrible, but you're good. God, we messed up so much, but you're faithful. That'd be great to end the chapter there. But they continued on. Because they remember, once again, remember the scene. They're saying, God, we call out to you. We own our stuff. And in verse 33, they said this, yet you have been righteous in all that has come upon us. Oh, think about that once again. Yet you have been righteous in all that has come upon us. For you have dealt faithfully and we have acted wickedly. Church, when it comes to true repentance, it's remembering two things. God is righteous and you're wrong. I gotta say it again for you note takers out here. True repentance is remembering two things. God is righteous and you're wrong. For those that are struggling with your marriage right now, and you're struggling with that communication. There's so many times that you can tell God, but God, she said this, or God, he said that. God, what does God say about it? Husbands, doesn't God say, love your wives as Christ loves the church? That he cares for her, that he sacrifices for her, that he loves her. Doesn't he say that, church? Wives, doesn't the Bible say to forgive? Doesn't it say to love one another? 
I don't hear any amens on that one. God desires, once again, for you not just to know it, but to live it, to make that journey of 18 inches. True repentance. And here's the last thing I wanna leave with you guys is this. Once again, they could have been left with, God, we messed up. God, we're horrible. But the repentance led them to action. The repentance led them to action. In verse 38, they said, because of all this, we make a firm covenant in writing. They didn't just beat themselves up saying, God, I'm horrible. God, what are you even doing with me? They were willing to say, God, I know that you're good. I know that you're faithful. I know that you're just. And God, I wanna apply it in my lives and I wanna make a covenant with you. I want to start over, God. God, I know all this and I've been going 100 miles per hour in one way and I know I need to repent right now. And God, I know that you'll forgive me and I know that you'll be here. True repentance, guys, is a step towards Jesus. Let me tell you the difference between condemnation and conviction. Condemnation is a tool that the devil uses. Condemnation will say, not only the things that you're doing are bad, but you yourself are bad. You yourself not only struggle with shame, but you yourself are shame. And since you are shame, God doesn't want to deal with you. God wants nothing to do with you. And that's a tactic that the enemy uses. Now, conviction. Jesus talks about conviction all the time. And what conviction does is that the Holy Spirit says, what you're doing is wrong. And what you're doing is driving a wedge with that relationship you have with the Father. Repent. Repent. For, ask for forgiveness. Rethink your thinking. Make that U-turn. Take that 18-inch journey, right? And, and what do we do? That leads us to the Father. And maybe that leads us to our knees. Maybe that leads us to lifting up our hands. Whatever it may be, conviction will always lead you to the Father. Do you see the difference in condemnation and conviction? And the master said, yes, amen. Church, you can live in God's grace. I love what Titus talks about. One of my professors said this, think about grace as holy fuel. The saint burns more fuel than the sinner because we need God every single day and we own it and we confess it and we say, God, I need you in everything because God, without you, I am a spiritual zero. So church, as I land the plane right now, let's take some time as we worship the Lord in this last song and say, God, where do I need to repent? God, where is it that I have been living for myself? Where is it in my life that I'm struggling with my pride? Where in my life am I dealing with unforgiveness? Where in my life, Lord, have I become hardened to your spirit? Can we do that, church? And as we take some time, as we worship God and we are honest with him and we confess this, if there's anybody here that does not know Jesus, I'm gonna flip the script a little bit. I'm gonna ask you, I'm gonna sit right here. Would you come and talk to me? I would love to tell you about Jesus. I would love to open the scriptures with you and I would love to show you how you can have Christ in your heart today. Cool, church? So Father, I thank you so much for tonight. I thank you so much, Lord, that you allow us to even repent, that you don't give up on us, Lord, even though we make one mistake or a thousand. But Father, you continually to give access to us, Lord, and opportunities to us, Lord, to say, I'm sorry, to say, forgive me. And so Holy Spirit, I ask, Lord, as you minister to my brothers and sisters here, that you would have them, Lord, to come to repentance to rethink their thinking about that situation, that relationship, that issue. And that you would help them, Father, to remember your faithfulness and continue to make that journey, Lord, of 18 inches from their head to their heart. Thank you so much, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen.